Thank you. Children, you are dismissed for junior church, ages 4 through 4th grade. For those of you who are staying with us, why, if you take your Bibles and turn with me once again to Matthew 26. Couldn't help but uh, recognize in the the words that we sang and some of the words that were on the wall as musicians played them that there was some beautiful doctrine set forth uh, right from the scriptures themselves and uh, very poignant words that bring us to that place of saying, Lord, here I am, here's my life. It's just, it's nothing, but oh God, I pray that you would just lead me in the way you would have me go, that my purpose might be fulfilled, not that my ambitions may be fulfilled apart from seeking the Lord and allowing him to have his will and way in my life. One of those uh, songs said this, a soul that thirsts for holiness in godly fear. We have forgotten in America that we are to fear God. And I trust that today as we gather together and look at God's word, we will see in the model given through the Son of God himself, our Savior, our mighty God, as he yields himself and surrenders himself, remembering that he was fully man and is fully God. And as he goes to Gethsemane and he enters into that time of prayer and this time of uh, uh tremendous um, uh, difficulty, I would say, because of, just perhaps because of the angst of the situation. And as a human being, fully human, coming before Almighty God, his Father, part of the Godhead, and surrendering himself, bringing himself as a man, with all the emotions and the feelings of a man, surrendering himself to the almighty will of God. And I trust that we will look at that as an example of ourselves. It's hard to uh, consider ourselves being in a, a situation as Jesus was, but our lives as we serve him uh, just reflect what God the Son um, did for us and how his life touches our life in, in reality, not simply uh, in thinking of a God somewhere, someplace out of, out of our, our whole scheme of thinking and out of our, what we are aware of in our perception of God, but also as our Savior, that one who came, offered himself as sin's penalty, payment of sin's penalty, that we might be born again, born again. Just like Nicodemus in chapter 3, we see uh, Jesus speaking to this great man, a Sadducee, a man of great learning, a man who was a leader of the religious group of Jesus' day. And yet Jesus addresses him and says, you must be born again. And so then we begin to see through Nicodemus' life, and we only see him mentioned a few times in Scripture, but there in chapter 3, there's not much given in that Scripture that, that would show us, reveal too much about the man and what he did in relationship to Christ. But we do hear the gospel very clearly given by the Savior himself and the demand of a changed life, a transformed life that only God can give. And then later on we see him once again spoken of as he takes a stand and then later on even later on as he joins uh, Joseph there and uh, in taking the body of Christ defending the Lord Jesus in that way and so declaring with his life and that's what God demands that we declare our faith our trust our belief not simply by coming to church or singing some songs or being emotionally attached to certain parts of Scripture, but actually entering into the very life of Jesus that Christ gives out and pours into our lives. And so today as we look at this portion of Scripture, I'm not going to reread 
all of it, but I do want to call your attention to a number of, of aspects or parts of that scripture. So keep your Bibles open if you would, and, and if you would, just as the backdrop of it, remember the scripture we read at the uh, call to worship in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25, where Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, you must deny yourself. In other words, die to self. Take up your cross and follow me. That's a personal invitation given to each one of us, isn't it? And it goes beyond just simply opening our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a laying down of our lives in full surrender to our God to serve him no matter what. We have wonderful, wonderful examples of that given to us. And I want to speak about one this morning or share with you one that you perhaps have known uh, uh, in your own experience. But before we do that, I want you to go, if you would, to verse 36 of chapter 26. And we have come through, we've seen Jesus coming through this time uh, in the Last Supper. We have seen uh, this whole time when Jesus dealt with the Apostle Peter, who was uh, not the apostle at that time, but Peter at that time was just, he was the one oftentimes who was outspoken and would just speak his mind without thinking too deeply about what he was saying. And yet the Lord Jesus loved this man and he saw the beginning to the end and he saw what would become of Peter. And just so Jesus looks into our lives, all of us are different people. And yet all of us must begin our journey with Christ at the cross. And Jesus sees what is in our lives, and he sees how we will actually come to that place when we will lay down our very lives and our wills before him. And we have this portion of Scripture, I believe, to give us a marvelous example of that in the Lord Jesus, our Savior, to help us. God knows that we're in this world and our lives are embroiled in every aspect of it, in our working, in our raising families, in our collecting monies so that we can live throughout our days in comfort. <clears throat> but he also sees us as his own and he calls to us individually and he says, you must deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. To someone in Jesus' day, when he spoke those words, they knew exactly what Jesus was talking about because the cross was an instrument of torture and death. And as we come and we look at this, we, we see so often, we see ourselves separated somehow from those people Jesus was immediately speaking to in the word. And yet, we must see that Jesus is speaking to us in 2019 just as importantly as he spoke to Peter and the group of men and the disciples and those who were following at that time. And I think this morning as I came in to uh, worship and, and was looking forward to this time we had, I just, it just kind of blew me away when I, I thought of, of people who had dedicated their lives to serving him. We have the Arviks here today. We have people like that who have, uh, have decided that in their, their, these years of their lives that they are going to give their lives wholeheartedly to the service of Jesus Christ and his church. We are introduced to a missionary couple and how we are reminded that Jesus is not finished calling people to the ministry we call missions. In fact, he calls every one of us to that place. And he may just call you individually to a very specialized form of missions where you actually leave home and you go and you make home wherever he opens the door and where he leaves you. God has called us to something very serious. I think I was reminded as I saw these young men from Bob Jones today that there was a time in my life as a student where I, in a service, a missionary service, committed my life to the Lord Jesus. It was the beginning of a purposeful direction in my life to serve Jesus Christ other than serving myself in my job, 
in my goals for a family of the future, in my goals for a wife of the future, for a business, whatever God would choose. And I remember it was there in the midst of a service that I heard the voice of the Lord, not in my ears, but in my heart and my spirit as the word of God came forward. And Jesus himself says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And do you know, to tell you the truth, I was involved emotionally and I was a young man and I wanted to see the fire of God consuming my life and consuming what I was going to put my hands to do for the rest of my days for the glory of God. It's all nice in the midst of a time of an invitation and when we are emotionally called into that place of devoting our lives. But you know what? The rest of our life is there. And the difficulties of getting through school and the difficulties of, of, of uh, just managing life and doing the wise things in life begin to challenge the challenge that Jesus Christ gives to us. I heard these young men and each one of them in their majors and declaring their majors or sharing with us their majors. And I couldn't help but think, but God may have a different call. He may have a different pathway. And I found that in my life. And yet we come to this place where these people have been around Jesus, surrounding Jesus, and they've just sat at table with him. And he has introduced to them what we consider the Lord's Supper, the communion. And he began to unfold unto them again, allowing them to hear from his own mouth that there are days ahead of great passion and great suffering and ultimately death, but then resurrection. And the excitement that must have been in these, the, the minds and hearts of these men who really knew nothing more than that. And their understanding was small at that time. And now as I have followed the Lord Jesus for a number of years, I realize how limited my vision actually was. And although I would say, Lord, you lead me anywhere, anywhere, I'll do anything, Lord, you lead me, you tell me, you give me purpose, you give open doors to me, and I will follow you. You know who else said that? In the very scripture that we have, Jesus spoke to the hot-headed and hot-tempered Peter, who would one day be a marvelous example of a godly man do wonderful things in the name of Jesus. And yet, back here, when we look at him, he was just beginning. He was what we consider to be a baby Christian. But he was growing, wasn't he? And his purpose was to follow Jesus, but his idea was to follow him into the kingdom that Jesus would bring forth. And his idea was different than what Jesus was proposing. So often that's the case in our own lives. And so today I want to come to this portion of Scripture that is, is centered in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it, it begins in verse 36. And Jesus comes with them to a place called Gethsemane and said unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. That was a group of the disciples. He told them to sit while I go and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Grief was entering into his life at the idea of the very ministry he had come in full knowledge to perform as God himself. And yet I want you to understand that when we see Jesus in Gethsemane, it's not because he was fearful and frightened of what was ahead of him. But he, I believe, knew of the enormity of what this cup that is talked about here 
when Jesus says, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And we begin to get a glimpse of Jesus himself, God himself, coming fully man to pay in his body all the penalty of all the sin of mankind from the very beginning to the very end of the age. Your sin and my sin. And he knew the great strike must come at the hand of God. But I believe what troubled him most and more than anything else was the idea of this separation. How could the Godhead be separated? And yet Christ takes upon himself all of the sin and the worst kind that you can imagine. And takes it upon himself. And knows that as he takes upon himself all of that, that baptism of sin, mankind's sin, that God will turn away. Jesus was willing to do that for you and for me. The book of Philippians tells us he was willing to do it for the, the joy that was set before him. And we're part of that joy, the redeemed of the Lord. We're part of the glory of Almighty God as we live and serve and eventually stand in His presence. We can't even imagine that. Verse 37 tells he, he took with him then Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And then he said unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. He's just simply saying, you stay in this place and pray with me. Watch with me. Be close to me. And I believe that this is what the call of discipleship is all about. That as we grow up in Jesus Christ, as we mature in Jesus, our desire to, to sit with him, to tarry with him, and to watch with him becomes a very important part of the aspect of discipleship growing up, maturing in him. I want us to look today at the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I want us to see here that uh, Jesus was praying not a self-centered prayer at all. This is the Lord of glory in flesh, incarnate God himself. And he prays, thy will be done. Jesus himself praying, thy will be done. Jesus knew the will of God. It included you and it includes me. But we see him in Gethsemane. By the way, this whole idea of Gethsemane, it, it, it means a, a, a press, an olive press, the very name. It's a pr place of pressure. And here Jesus selects this place to meet with his disciples and to come to this time when he comes before his heavenly father and cries out in prayer, thy will be done. I believe that this is the most difficult prayer to pray. It's difficult for you. It's difficult for me because it goes right against our self-centeredness and our pride, and our desire to have it our way after all. I, I, um, I read as a, a young man um, a book that uh, I think probably many of you have read, and I gave it to my sons as well, but uh, I was just a little boy when a man by the name of, of Nate Saint dedicated his life to the Lord and came to a place where he 
sensed the call of God in his life and he heard Jesus saying, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. The book that I read was um, Through Gates, Gates of Splendor and um, by Elizabeth Elliot, one of the wives of the men who were killed on the beach in Ecuador, men who had devoted their lives. They were not much older than you fellows that sang to us and gave testimony today. Not much older than I was as I sat in college, in a college chapel. And I had known Jesus Christ, but it was then at that time that Jesus seemed to draw me to himself with those very words, this very scripture. Nate Saint, Nate Saint is, a, is a, an example of a man who hears God's call to serve him. If you haven't read the book, we have it in our library. We have several copies. Please take it out, read it. I think that was probably in the 50s that that all happened, early 50s, mid 50s, last century. And I remember as a little boy, I was probably maybe six years old, and our church had gotten the news of the death of these missionary men, savagely put to death by the very men and women that they had come to share the good news with, taking time to make relationship. And then as they entered into that opportunity to share with these people with the great burden that God had laid upon their hearts. Underscoring it all is this idea of self-denial and death. Take up your cross and follow me, Jesus said. And I remember as just a little boy hearing the words that these missionaries had died and hearing rather graphic terms of their death. And being shaken. I wasn't a believer at that time. But I was a little boy who loved Jesus. I had grown up in a home that put Jesus first. In a church where people loved missions. And sharing the gospel. But I hadn't come to the place where I actually knew Christ. But this influenced me so much. And caused me even to. I remember just the, the idea of trembling in the very idea that a man died, actually died, and he was doing something that was supposedly a wonderful thing in our church. At least that's what I heard. And Nate sent Saint, along with other men who responded to the gospel call, young men who had given themselves to serious study of the word of God, seriously giving themselves un unswerving in their desire to serve God, believing that God's word must go forth even if blood, human blood, must be shed, that it go forth. Offering himself, I believe, there on the altar of God in, I believe it was Wheaton College, he was in a, a chapel as well. God spoke to him about offering his life, denying himself, taking up his cross, that instrument of death, going forth for the rest of his days to serve the Lord Jesus as he would, trusting the Lord all along the way. And what was a terrible tragedy in the mind of a six-year-old child. And then later on, as I grew to love the Lord Jesus, I, I was 11 when I was saved. And then as I went on into school, and I, the Lord began to speak to me about serving him with my whole life. And always in the backdrop was this great sacrifice that had traumatized me as a little boy. And I had to come that day in that chapel service and say, Lord, if it means that I have two weeks to serve you, a day to serve you, I want to serve you with the rest of my life, no matter what you call me into doing. That's where we ought to be right now, today. Today. 
there ought to be a sense of surrender to the Lord. Thy will be done. Jesus teaches us to say it. And here, Nate Saint offers himself on this altar of God, willing to lay down his very life for the sake of the gospel. You know, when you're in college, you think you're invincible and that the end of life will never come. And whether it's in a mission field somewhere where violently your life is taken or whether you're running down your block jogging and you drop dead of a heart attack or whatever may happen in life, your goal and your purpose is take on a different responsibility, an ad- atmosphere when we are saying, yes, Lord, here I am, use me. That's what God desires to hear from us as a congregation. He has planted us here in the middle of this town, this city. And all around us, there are people who are going to hell every bit as much as when Nate Saint went to Ecuador and was communicating with those people who couldn't understand anything at that time of what he was saying apart from pictures and pointing. And you see, he was willing to go and go into a very dangerous and hostile situation, but he was willing to go because he had said, Yes, Lord, thy will be done. I read in relationship to this, this statement, cross-bearing is a, a deliberate personal choice to abandon all and to serve Christ as he leads through life. Sometimes we think the end of life is tragic. It's only tragic if you haven't been serving the Lord, if you're not where God wants you to be. So we come to this scripture and we go back to Matthew 26. Just a few thoughts. I realize our time is passing. I want you to understand this, that I do believe that this is probably the most difficult prayer a man or a woman or a young person or a child can pray. Thy will be done. And you see, I believe that's related in Matthew's gospel to chapter 16, that very scripture that we used about denying self and taking up our cross and following Jesus. Same Lord, same Bible. And we look at this and we we see how this is related to what Jesus is teaching his disciples, Peter and John. James, all these men together. And what he says in this time as Jesus comes to this point in his life where he is ready to lay down his life as a sacrifice, he just says to those, come and sit here while I pray. And then to those, the inner circle, so to speak. Those were who were really devoted to him. He says, come in verse 38. He says, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry, stay, tarry ye here, and watch with me. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Next time you have an opportunity to sit with your Bible, just you and the Lord, hear Jesus say that, tarry ye here and watch with me. And see if he doesn't speak to you in that time. You know, there are those who say, O Lord God, thy will be done. But there are others, yes, in the church to whom God must say, have it your way. How about you? I look at myself and I say, O Father, too often I've said, 
I've, been, I've said, this is what I want, this is what I want, and finally God will say, well, have it your way. Have it your way. I want you to understand that as Jesus comes to pray, he's teaching us that to pray this kind of prayer to Almighty God as a believer today requires the surrender of your soul to him. Verse 38. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Can we say, O oh Lord Jesus, my soul so longs to be at your control. I think we see, begin to see the, the depth of the Lord's commitment to fulfilling the plan of eternal God. But this prayer was a preparation for the cross of Calvary. It was a preparation for this one who was fully man, fully God, but fully man, just like you, just like I am. We must come to that place as, as we are preparing for the remainder of our lives in serving the Lord Jesus Christ and living out God's will for our lives. The man Nicodemus hears from Jesus that marvelous portion of Scripture from John chapter 3 that we base so much upon. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Very, very new to this man. Very new to this man who was a teacher of men. I believe that was the very beginning of life for him and his life as an important leader and elder among the household of Israel really began in earnest then. And we see him later on declaring Jesus, taking a stand for Christ. But here I believe that Jesus is calling his disciples to full surrender. If you will come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow. Take that action. Oh, the requirement of surrender of our very souls to God is such an important thing. And we must remember it. We must remember that when we get up in the morning, I remember that that part of that testimony of this young man who says, now when I get up in the morning, I want to know what God has for me in the day. How are you going to lead me this day? I am at your disposal, O oh Lord, this day. And Jesus is calling his disciples to full surrender even now. You know what? We hold back. We hold back from God in certain areas of our lives that are a detriment to the work of Almighty God in our neighborhoods, in our homes, in our churches, in our world. But there's something else here. If, if you uh, look at verse 39, he says, And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So we find here a beautiful model for us or an example of surrender of the will. Do you realize that's one of the most difficult things we have in life is to surrender our wills to anybody else? That's probably the very root of so many disturbing things that go on in churches and families being torn apart because there's no surrender of the will out of the love of God and for the purpose of God. And here this prayer is, if we're going to pray a prayer like this, it requires a surrender of our will to the Lord. We have stubborn, stubborn wills. Does anybody have to say that to you? My wife tells me this oftentimes. Oftentimes. 
Do you know why? It's because we're born with stubborn, self-centered wills. Sometime when you have an opportunity to read through Romans chapter 7 and you see the Apostle Paul sharing with us the very difficulty there is in surrendering our wills to the will of God. That's a struggle. Both men and animals have this problem. Sometimes men, we're called animals, aren't we? But maybe because it's in relation to the to this. We have a stubborn will. You try to, try to, try to lead a, a, a dog where he does not want to go, absolutely go. Yesterday we saw my son was taking a little calf that he had had there for the party and, and two, two sheep and, and some goats and a little tiny goat. And they were trying to pull those things toward the, the trailer. And those things put their hooves into that dirt and they would not go. And they would not go. It took more than one man to pull on that rope to take a little baby cow and get him in a trailer. And I got to thinking then that that cow has a will that's about like mine. Have you ever seen yourself or known yourself to dig in? And not move and not budge even though you know that you ought to be going where you're being led. You put a, a, a bit in a horse's mouth or even worse in a mule's mouth and you do that to control their wills. We have a stubborn will, folks. I wonder if you're here today and you've known about Jesus and you've heard many things said about Christ and maybe you've even read in the Word of God the testimony of salvation, personal salvation. And yet there are many who refuse to come to Christ. It's because of a stubborn will and maybe you're experiencing that. I'm wondering today if you are a believer and yet you have refused to be obedient in this matter of personal forgiveness because of your stubborn will, because somebody has stepped on your feet. That's so easy to do, isn't it? It's so easy to be the one who steps on people's feet too. We're not careful. We need to yield to God and make his will our own will. And if we would do that, we would experience, first of all, God's peace. And also in yielding to Christ, we find forgiveness and we find freedom to live in his fullness, to live in his divine purpose. One more thing, I'm, I know it's late, in uh, verses 40 through 46, I'm not going to read all of this. But Jesus is there and he, he says, could you not watch with me one hour, he says to Peter. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Oh, this is so important for us, folks. Oftentimes temptations come into our lives and as Christians there are besetting sins that take hold of us. And I believe it's because we're not tarrying with Christ. We're not watching with Christ. We're not being careful in this matter of surrendering and yielding to the will of God, the known will of God. How do we know the will of God? Get into His Word. And I want to associate that just in closing this whole idea in, in these verses. I believe that if we're going to pray as Jesus prayed, thy will be done, no matter what, O oh God, thy will be done, then we're going to find that even though we would surrender our wills, there are brothers and sisters in the church and certainly outside the unsaved people that we deal with all the time that absolutely fail when it comes to surrendering the will. We need to come in a way that requires our absolute dedication 
to obedience and following Christ. How easy it is to give in to the flesh. You know that. You know that as well as I do. And every day we're tempted and we're, we're, we're tested in this matter of obedience to the, to the word of God rather than obedience to our flesh. The law of that flesh within. It's so easy to give in. And the sad thing is others are very likely to fail us. And then what do we do? You know, the Lord Jesus' call is to you personally. It isn't to the crowd that you hang with. It's to you personally. And when other people fail you in following Jesus, you must go on in obedience. It's called dedication. What did Jesus do when his disciples failed him? Well, he went again the second time and he prayed, verse 42. There was absolute failure all around him, and yet it says here in verse 44, he went again in the third time and he prayed. And so I would just encourage you today and challenge you today that we must remain faithful to Christ when others fail him in our day and in our age. And it doesn't take very long for you to see how our world has turned on Jesus in a brand new, stronger way than ever before. Absolute rejection of his word. Absolute rejection of his principles. Absolute rejection of his calling and his claim upon our lives. I wonder today if you have been resisting the will of God. Then I would say to you, listen to the voice of the Lord. Listen to the word of the Lord. Are you willing to surrender at all? Are you? I would just say to you today, come now in this quietness to the one who surrendered absolutely all for you. Let's pray, shall we?